Assalamu alaikum friends. Uh, my name is Abdul Azim Umar. Uh, I was born and grew up in Sudan. Uh, I like to talk to the people around the world. Uh, today I have a wonderful guest. Uh, his name is Shankar Hamidi and uh, he's a facilitating workership global transformative land, uh, landership and he's a great career and uh, social activities and uh, he's an uh, entrepreneur ship and uh, he want to make friends around the world let me request him he introduce himself for us hi shankar how are you good evening assalamu alaikum namaste how are you yeah i'm great thank you so much for coming thank you for your time yeah so uh, i love your background again uh, this is in uh, saudi arabia are you in riyadh no now uh, i am uh, in mecca oh in mecca okay yes uh, thank you so much uh, shankar please could you introduce yourself for the audience who you who are you yeah my name is shankar hamadi and i was uh, born in india and um, my early education was entirely in india uh, i grew up in uh, the suburbs of bombay or mumbai and uh, india was a socialist country at that time so my entire education uh, was paid for by the government of india and a few uh, ngos non profits so i feel the strong desire to give back to society uh, all the way from um, middle school all the way through college even at iit bombay everything was taken care of by the government and uh, many um, community uh, community non profits community ngos and uh, education is one of the best things somebody can give you because it's a gift that keeps on giving and um, uh, it so happened that when i graduated in 1986 there were hardly any jobs in the computer industry at that time in india my first job was with tata consultancy services or tcs and they shipped me to the us because that's how it was in those days and i thought i was going for 6 months ended up living in america for 30 years uh, much of it initially was in the engineering area in electronics graphics and other areas of electronics and later in um, as i found that some of my close friends were dying of cancer i got interested in um, what we can do about that my wife um, has a background in uh, biotechnology and pharmaceuticals so we both decided to work on how to reduce toxicity of medicines and we worked on what's called toxicology and uh, to be able to assess the quality of medicines like right now for covid there are medicines but many of them are quite toxic so like the hydrochloroquine there's a it doesn't necessarily help because some people may die because of the toxicity of hydrochloroquine instead of dying for covid so this is the challenge about many medications for long term chronic illnesses or in the case of cancer so i worked on that for a few years but as i got deeper into medicine i realized that there is a much deeper challenge that all of us face even right now many of us are facing which is feeling satisfied or happy in life right now so many people are getting sick or because of the lockdowns a lot of people have lost jobs and people feel like they're in jail you know staying at home yes so so people yeah. become miserable very common that people start feeling sad and depressed and anxious so a lot of my work starting in i would say 2010 was about how to reduce anxiety depression i'm not a therapist i'm not a clinical psychologist but i studied positive psychology i studied neuroscience to a certain extent on my own and later at stanford medical school um, a place called the center for compassion and altruism research and went to the bottom of it also studying along with that the basis of religion um, i've studied a lot more about uh, 
uh, Hindu practices. Um, I was a teacher at one of the places like Chinmaya Mission. I also studied, uh, I used to go to church once in a while. And then I found uh, Sufi friends because of whom I learned about Zikr as well as about uh, Darvesh dances. You know, they keep spinning around. So along with the Sufis and Jalaluddin Rumi and teachings of uh, Hafiz. Um, likewise studied a Buddhist Vipassana or sitting in silence and observing the body and mind. And then went deeper into the neuroscience, how uh, all these things have the potential to change our body and mind and bring about calmness. So I worked on those things. The last, I would say, 10 years, slowly I phased out of the electronics and biotechnology and I've gone deeper into leadership, uh, particularly with the focus on personal leadership, finding meaning in life, finding a way to um, have a really good balanced life based not only on um, our values, including like, how do I feel about religion? How do I feel about being kind or compassionate? At the same time, being practical, and how do I take care of my finances? How do I take care of my success in life? Connecting success, not just to money, but also to a meaning in life and purpose in life. So that's what I've been doing. That's what keeps me busy. Mashallah, mashallah. That is so great. Thank you so much for sharing everything you are doing. Well, I think you are amazing and you are likely this life. <laughs> well, we are yeah. all amazing and we forget that many times, isn't it? <laughs> we are yes. all, if you believe in God, we are children of the same God. Or if you don't believe, yes. we are still have the same DNA, right? We have very, lot of things are common and we forget that and we feel that one person is special and others are not. <laughs> yes, that is so great. That's so uh, interesting. Uh, so, uh, you know, Shankar, uh, you are grow up in, uh, in India and uh, you spend more your life in USA. Could you tell us about your journey from India to USA? Well, uh, as I mentioned, uh, first 22 years of my life, I was in India. So um, that was the culture I grew up in, um, you know, all the dynamics. Uh, it was a, a socialist and secular country, which it still is. Uh, secularism is still there in India. As far as socialism is concerned, we have moved a little more towards enterprise and capital, which is also necessary. The, you know, the industry is needed. Uh, but when I went to the US, the biggest change was not as much. Um, there were some changes, but the biggest change was yeah. an understanding that I cannot speak other languages are to speak in English. Uh, in India, I was used to mixing languages. Hindi, which is the national language, Marathi, the language of Bombay, my own mother tongue from Goa, which is Konkani. So we just mix and match. And you have lived in Bangalore, right? So you know how yes. easily we like to mix Namaskara or the Kannada language with the Hindi language with the English. So once I went to America, I realized I have to really speak and think more like an American in terms of language and um, culture. But um, luckily the difference between American culture and Indian was not so much. The biggest difference was economic. Uh, America was more capitalistic, but at the same time they have the social security and welfare system. So it is capitalism along with the cushion. So if people don't have jobs like right now, you know, more than 30, 40 million people don't have jobs in America. So there is a, there's a soft landing. Uh, the government will try to give at least basic minimum food, basic money for survival, which is not great, but at least it's there. So it's, social, it's capitalism with the heart, which is like socialism with some free enterprise. So India moved more and more closer to the American model uh, India still doesn't have social security or Medicare for the poorest, but then again, there is healthcare at different levels. So uh, the, the biggest difference was an understanding that in America, if you start something on your own, there are many more, the government encourages that a lot. The whole system encourages that a lot. 
it's becoming like that in yeah. India also and in other countries. But in 1987, within seven years, I was able to get into startups in electronics and later in biotechnology. And there was tremendous support for that. Uh, so that's what kept me in America, uh, to be able to start things together. What was interesting also was that um, people would get together irrespective of race, culture, religion. So some of my partners have been from Pakistan and from Bangladesh or from Israel. So you would have on the same table, you had an Israeli Jew and a Pakistani Muslim and an Indian all working together for doing something great. Companies like Google, companies like Yahoo and Facebook, and a good mix yeah. like that. You know, Yahoo was founded. Uh, uh, sorry, um, Facebook was founded by a Jewish person um, by the name of uh, Zuckerberg. But again, the secular nature of companies allows any and everybody to participate, and that's what makes America really strong. Um, India has had many aspects of secularism. Uh, there has been always, India is the second largest Muslim country in the world with yeah. about 200 million people of Islamic faith. So to that extent, India has always been secular and there have been uh, laws that protect faith, whether it's uh, Buddhist or it's, um, uh, what we, we even had Jewish people and we have people from um, Sikhism and Jainism. So yeah, um, I was very happy about the fact that in America, um, not only is it secular, but also people mingle, work together, no problem at all, just like in big cities like Bombay. So yeah, I would say uh, culturally it was not a big shock. It was actually a delight. Uh, but after 20, 30 years of working in America, there was a realization that I should also do something for my motherland. I have been volunteering for the last several years, initially in America. And now in the last three years, quite a bit in um, India. But after having done that, I also felt, um, as you, we were discussing earlier, I love languages and different cultures. So I traveled extensively to more than 20 states in India in the last three years, learning about the music and the dance and the language a little bit, not a whole lot, but just enough to be able to mingle whether it's Karnataka where you visited or uh, I was there for six months or Punjab or Rajasthan or uh, Uttarakhand. Um, and likewise, now I've started on a journey around the world, uh, starting initially with South Korea. And then uh, I was also for about four months, more than three months in Mexico, learned Espanol and a little bit about uh, the culture of uh, Mexico the Spanish and the Latino languages and uh, uh, the food and everything. So yeah, that's a big thing for me. I feel that uh, it is important for me at this stage in my life to visit more countries. Speaking of which, I have Saudi Arabia as well as Sudan in mind. I've never visited um, uh, Africa. So that's my next goal to, uh, uh, to go to Africa and maybe from there to South America. And the reason is, as you know, all life, human life began in Africa. So all our ancestors are originally from the continent. And uh, there's so much to learn. I really know, know much about it. Everybody in my family has been there to Ethiopia, to Tanzania. Um, I have not gone anywhere. So maybe I will take up your offer to visit you in Sudan. Uh, yes, uh, you know, all, all of people in Sudan, they, they will be uh, open their heart when you to visit him in this future place yeah. and uh, visit him, you know. Uh, I will invite, I will invite you to visit uh, in my country, in my, uh, in my siblings, they can uh, collect with him together. Thank That's you. Really, I'm so happy when you visit us. Thank you, Shokran, Shokran. So, uh, in fact, interestingly, how is the pandemic situation, COVID situation in Sudan and Saudi Saudi Arabia? So, you know, you know uh, this time, uh, situation here in Saudi Arabia and Sudan is going on good, alhamdulillah. Uh, everything uh, is good and uh, all of shops, they're open. Everything here, they're going on same of before life, but they are tech. Uh, 
they are, they are take them there be carefully and uh, they are uh, put distance uh, with the people and in the restaurant but you know there is uh, some of things they not open like uh, stadium uh, play football all of the sports now it's uh, closed but everything here in Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia going on, alhamdulillah. But here's, you must wear the mask every day. When you go out the house, you must wear the mask and uh, be carefully and everything is good, inshallah. And I hope everything, it shall go same like before. Um, what about, uh, are foreigners allowed now? Foreign tourists allowed to come into the country? Sorry? Are foreigners allowed to visit Saudi Arabia or Sudan? So, you know, now this time, uh, all of foreigners, they can go their countries. But this time, Saudi Arabia not not allowed yet to the foreigners. They, they came to Saudi Arabia this time because they want to look, uh, look at the cases of COVID-19 uh, COVID this time. And uh, they can allow it to the foreigners they enter in Saudi Arabia after 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 this uh, pandemic, inshallah. But you know, now if you want to go to your country, you can go. Now air or of airport now their uh, plan they go to some of countries from Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so you know, Shankar, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, everything about you and about your journey and about your what do you love and what do you like so now uh, you are leadership how can to be leadership could you tell uh, could you tell us a little bit about leadership yeah when i mentioned that i am into leadership training people assume many things one of the first things this is why does everybody have to be a leader and I'm like, we have no choice but to be a leader. Um, not necessarily, leader does not mean you have to have an army of thousand people following you. That's not what I mean. <laughs> we have to lead our life. Everything you do in your life. If I don't decide, if I'm not deliberate about what I want to do in my life, I'll be just blindly following somebody or something. So even following, let's say for example, for a religious person, um, to follow religion has to be a conscious decision. Then they can be a really good Muslim or a really good Hindu because they are now doing it consciously. So it's my belief that uh, leadership begins at a very personal level. We have to understand what our purpose in life is. Why am I here? What am I doing? Whatever I'm doing. Uh, as you said, Alhamdulillah. So we have to understand that everything that happens there's some sort of a purpose and that's a self-discovery process. I cannot tell uh, you, uh, Azama, what you should do. I can suggest, I can suggest some things, but at the end of the day, Azama has to make up his mind and for that he may consult maybe an imam, he may consult his teachers, he may consult his boss. At the end of the day, it is important that Azama takes his own decision in a way that is most useful, most meaningful, not only to just make money, but also to have meaning in your life, right? So that's where yeah. I begin with. Like I always ask the question, why are we doing what we are doing? And what is it that we really want in our life? Why am I here? And uh, who am I mixing with? Like often we just fall into, like you were born in Sudan and I was born in India. so. It is very convenient to just stay where we are. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it can be limiting. So now that you are in Saudi Arabia and I travel between India and America and other countries, it opens my mind. So, but it has to be a conscious decision that do I really want to live in India or in America or I want to travel and what's the purpose of the travel and what do I want to do? So these are the fundamental questions. When I start a leadership workshop, I really ask people to think about what does success mean to them? Success is success only money. And if it's not only money, then even if say, okay, I just want a billion dollars. Okay, what will you do if you have a billion dollars? What, yeah. What's the purpose? Will you be able to eat with the money? No. How much can you eat? 
will get diabetic if you eat too much. So, so there's a limit to how much you can even spend. So finding a sense of direction, finding, a, becoming more self-aware, what is my purpose, is a big part of my leadership journey. And there are a few common elements, even if you're leading people, if you're doing artwork, some creative leadership, or if we are in charge of an army, you know, everywhere, there are a few things that are common. First is self-awareness, as I said, understanding oneself. And the next is understanding others around us. So which means basic listening skills, basic communication skills. Like Azama, every time I have been with you, you're a really good listener. So that's a very <laughs> important skill, not only for an interviewer, but even in life. A mother has to listen to the children to understand what their real desires are. A mother has to know when the child is hungry, for example. A boss has to know when her or his employees have certain needs. Like right now, if people are worried about COVID, they will not be able to perform if we ask them, if you force them to come to the office. So they have, the boss has to make sure that everything is done right, whether it is a sanitizer, or it's uh, you know uh, keeping warm water or providing masks. There's so many things, right? So uh, having yes. that understanding and compassion and empathy as to what do people around me need, what do I need, what do others need, how do we bring everybody together? So these are common things: learning basic listening skills, basic communication skills, basic skills of compassion and caring. And there are many different techniques I use, including dance and movement. One might wonder, what yes. does movement have to do with, um, with compassion or with anything else? Nonverbal communication. Many times we won't say a word, but from the body language of the other person, we have an understanding, how does that person feel? A lot, more than 70% of communication is nonverbal. That's why I have the confidence that when I go to Mexico, I didn't know Spanish, but using body language and from English, I was able to learn Espanol. Just listening to people every day again and again, como estas, and similarly with Arabic, I'm just starting to learn Arabic. And again, a lot of it is body language, uh, understanding how people move. So these are things that are common, listening, listening mm. to oneself, listening to others, being able to say simple things, in a way that helps build community, cooperation, support. And there are many more skills, but these are like the absolute basic minimum. So that's where the leadership focus is. Identifying what our biggest strengths are. You know, uh, I'm not the best listener, but I'm a good storyteller. So I need to know that. So am I better at listening? Or to be a good storyteller, I also have to listen. Otherwise, where did I get my new stories from? By listening to people. So learning what are our biggest strengths. Uh, some people like to organize things. Some people like to come up with new ideas or new vision. Some people like to um, strategize and say how to implement new ideas, new vision. Some people like to be very creative and go, they go in their corner and come up with new ways of doing things including one guy, Mark Zuckerberg, sits down and creates the first version of Facebook. And we'll see that everywhere. Some people are ideas people. Some people are very sociable and want to build society, build community. Mm -hmm. Some people want to build technology. So knowing our biggest strengths and focusing is also a part of leadership because we have to lead our lives and we have to lead it yeah. with strengths. Wow, that is so, so good. Absolutely, you know, it is so, so information when you tell us about this, about leadership. So uh, I can encourage the people, they can follow all of words when you say before. So, uh, you know, uh, Shankar, sometimes you talk some of, la some of language. I think you are like, you want to learn more language from all of countries, from all of people. Why do, you, why do you want to like, why do you want to like this language? 
Well, uh, as I said, one of the things I learned early on when I got into leadership and all that was that mm -hmm. one of my biggest strengths is connecting with people and with different cultures yeah. and communities. Language yeah. is at, at the heart of it. At least I have to understand what others are saying. I don't have to be an expert yeah. in everything, but at least I should be able to say hello. So if I meet you in Saudi Arabia or in Sudan, if I can just say, Assalamu alaikum, wa alaikum assalam, shokran, basic things like that. If I can just have one yeah. minute, two minute conversation, it breaks the ice. I'm not a stranger anymore. I'm not a foreigner anymore. If I can understand the words like kismet or bazaar or, you know, there are yes. thousands of words that are already <laughs> in common between Arabic and say Indian languages, Hindi, thousands of words. So even knowing that, yes. you know, just knowing basic words, basic structure of the language is tremendously mm. beneficial when I'm trying to understand people from a new culture. When I travel around the world, I'm not just interested in looking at buildings or nature, that is nice. But I'm interested in also listening to and understanding the values, the culture, the music, the dance, the food of different countries and different communities. Wow. So that's why. So I can say nice hello job. in practically every language that I've heard, like almost 70, 75 languages. And it's not that hard. MashaAllah, that is great. That is so good. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, Shankar, now we are from one greater. You can find Muslim and unmuslim. they share together, they play together, and they share some, do something together. Uh, how do you think about that and how encourage the people they can live together, they can live in peace together, and they can share uh, some of things together? You know, well, uh, I have visited before India. I can find some of people, a Muslim, a Muslim. They are, they are, they are live together. I think. What do you think about that? And how can encourage the people they can live that? Well, um, you know, as I said, I grew up in um, Bombay suburbs, where mm -hmm. Hindus, Muslims, Jains, Sikhs, uh, even Jews, we all studied together, played together. And uh, even today, India is very much secular. Uh, the rights of every religion are protected. Uh, you can go anywhere in India. Early morning, you will hear the call for the for the namaz. You know, early morning, like uh, at uh, dawn, and that is still the case. Uh, and in fact, uh, religious freedom is a big part of what India stands for. Uh, yes, majority of the people in India or of a Hindu faith or different faiths that are related to what we call Sanatan Dharma. But at the same time, Islam has been apart for a very long time. And so has Sikh and so has Jaina and many, many other smaller communities. And uh, Buddhism also took root in Buddha attained um, Nirvana in India, in Bodh Gaya, which is in Bihar. And so was Vardhaman Mahavira who uh, formed the Jaina. There are lots of religions here and uh, we've always lived together. One of my best friends in Bombay was Muhammad Siraj Hussain. And I used to go and even do Roja with him sometimes when I was a teenager uh, because it was curiosity. He would come and play Diwali and Holi, the festival of water, the colors, the festival of uh, lights. And uh, it is still totally common for people to do that. Uh, we love Sufi music like uh, Kawalis and Ghazals, and they also come to our bhajan sometimes. So I feel it, it is more human to be able to have this free flow, uh, yet people can keep their faith and uh, be totally devoted to their faith if that's what they want. That doesn't change anything. Uh, in Bollywood, for example, we have Amir Khan and uh, Salman Khan and, um, you know, Shah Rukh Khan. Uh, we all watch it. It doesn't matter whether you're Hindu or Muslim. We uh, eat together most of the time. Um, some people may be vegetarian, some people not. Some people will not touch beef, some people will not touch pork. And that's a matter of faith. 
And I think it is important that people keep their faith if that is, because that is necessary. It is a part of people's identity. But um, uh, I, I personally am a big believer and I've seen this in America as well as in India, that people do a lot of sharing and the cultural mix is actually very healthy. And um, I think it'll continue. <laughs> wow, that is good. That is, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for sharing uh, with your thoughts for the, the, our audience. Uh, so uh, now I think some of people, they are using social media. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about uh, what are benefits of <coughs> social media? What's your question about social media? Yes, uh, what are benefits of social media? Well, you and I are right now on social media. I would not have met you if it was not for social media, right? That's a big yes. benefit. I get to visit Saudi Arabia and Sudan soon. So that's a big benefit, right? <laughs> <laughs> so more, more seriously, um, social media has really brought the whole world closer to each other. And for yes. the most part, I think that's very positive. The younger people are able to appreciate and value not only their own culture, but also other cultures. They can learn what is more important to them. Um, education has become much easier. During the lockdown, schools are closed for safety reasons. People can learn online. Uh, there are people like Salman Khan in America who are offering Khan Academy. And you can get lots of classes for free. And there are other companies like Coursera and Udemy. So social media has encouraged learning about each other, uh, meeting each other. I have, besides people in San Francisco who came from more than 70 countries, I met people from rare countries like Macedonia, or countries I had not even heard of before, Arthreya and many other countries. So it gives me an appreciation of what human life is in remote parts of the world. And I think that's a great thing. Uh, this will yeah. remove all the biases we have, some of the narrow-mindedness we have, and replace it with a larger understanding of what's happening. But we have to be yes. careful. If I spend 10 hours, 15 hours a day, on the computer, my eyesight is gonna get weak. I will forget that there's a world around me. All I want to do is be on the computer. So we have to be careful. Social media is an extension of real life. It, shouldn't, it is not a substitute for real life. When I say <laughs> real life, I mean being with friends and family where you live. So having, like that's why I said, I want to come and visit Saudi Arabia and Sudan. Then you'll become a real friend in real life rather than just on the computer. Yes. You know what I mean? It is, I think, very yes, necessary. People, uh, like social gaming, like PUBG. People mm -hmm. get addicted to it. It's nice to play games and to learn about cultures. But if, if more than half my life is on the computer, I think it's, yes. we are running away from the real world right all around us. So we have to be careful about using it as a tool not as a survival mechanism. Yes, yes, that is good. Thank you so much. Uh, I think that is uh, so benefit. Now you can use social media, collect people, to, uh, uh, collect people together and uh, share everything together now. I think this is case is now uh, pandemic COVID-19. A lot of people, they are, uh, they are using social media. I think it's so benefit for us. Okay, thank you so much. So, uh, you know, uh, before uh, I was uh, I was uh, so shy with the, from camera with the talking with the people online like you. Now I think when I was uh, when I know uh, I know Mr. Rahin Alwala. He's from Pakistan. He's a successful uh, man. I think a lot of people in the world they know him. When I was uh, uh, be with the friend with him. Actually, uh, I will be so happy and uh, I will be, I have a confidence. Uh, I can be a brave, I can be a proud of myself. Uh, uh, I can talk with the people around the world. Alhamdulillah, now uh, I made a lot of friends from around the world. More than uh, 50 uh, countries from the world, I can talk with him. And uh, wow. I can understand their language, their listening. 
their uh, and their uh, accidents before i don't understand more the people when when uh, when talk with me sometimes i can hear the words not clearly but now alhamdulillah you know i can understand a lot of people they talk with me different ac uh, different accent and different language but i want to learn more language now i have a class online uh, thank you for you you are enjoying it before uh, you can see that uh, so what is your message you can give to me and give to my audience they they follow successful people like Rahinalwala, like you and you have a more experience in this life well first of all i want to acknowledge rehan is the reason why you and i got connected uh, i was yeah. introduced to rehan Amawala by carla richman from america she's a jewish woman yeah. and a very very amazing lady so Carla uh, somehow found me and uh, reintroduced me to Rehan. I had met Rehan about six years ago in America and forgotten about it. He, which is when he was doing this uh, a PC for everyone, trying to get everybody on laptops, PCs and connect. And uh, uh, Carla reinforced that in me that maybe I should talk to somebody from Pakistan who is trying to bring people around the world together. And in some ways I was doing that, I was visiting people, speaking their languages and they were speaking my language. So connecting with Rehan, Rehan three months ago, introduced me more deeply to live streaming. I had not done yes. any live stream before. Before that I used to do video blogging, so recorded videos like we are doing right now. But live streaming is something I still do rarely. I think he does it 10 hours a day. I only do it maybe 30 minutes a day. <laughs> But uh, oh, wow. it is, I think, very valuable to understand that um, understanding people, meeting people from around the world, listening to people, listening to their stories, um, understanding our purpose in life, understanding oneself, I think these yeah. things are very valuable. And uh, there has to be a balance between understanding oneself and the other and listening and talking. Uh, giving and receiving as much as i told you that i will come and visit you you're welcome to join me either in india or in america anytime i think you've been to india more than once right so you know what it's like you're wearing an indian kurta right now my first thought was hey he's an indian guy <laughs> so again so we have all these conceptions based on clothes and right. style so we, we can go beyond that we can go beyond our narrow conditioning and embrace everybody so alhamdulillah we can make this a very very beautiful world by connecting with different cultures and appreciating it and that's actually my purpose and i feel that people can find some of that useful if it is useful they will embrace it <laughs> Mashallah, alhamdulillah that is uh, very good very massive for uh, they are uh, successful people like uh, Raheen and uh, Carla Richma. And uh, Alhamdulillah, I visited her show before and uh, she was an amazing lady. And uh, their audience, mashallah, everything, uh, everything they are doing uh, good. Uh, that is good. So, you know, Shankar, uh, sometimes I show you a dancer and uh, I think you are love. Uh, Sangar and you all love to be dancing. Could you tell us a little bit about that? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I was, uh, as I mentioned earlier in my life, I was a computer guy. So most of the yeah. time I was in front of computers, which meant mm. really no physical exercise. And most of the thinking, most of the consciousness is from here to here. No yes. idea what's happening in the rest of the body. So, um, by the time I was even 38 years old, 40 years old, my doctor told me that um, I have to change my life, change my way of viewing things. My body was almost falling apart, which is when I discovered uh, meditation. And as I mentioned, along with meditation, I found dance in many different ways. Uh, the Darvishas and the Sufis are one approach. Another was the Garba and the Indian dances and line dancing and salsa. So all kind of came together at the same time, along with what's called dance therapy, 
or appreciating different rhythms in life. So that was a great um, change from being on the computer all the time. You know, it's very tempting to be on the computer because that's my, that was my comfort zone. But that was not helping me at the physical level. It was also not helping me at the emotional level, being in touch with my own emotion, being in touch with people. So I actually teach um, a form of heart dancing or connecting with the heart. Sometimes even with blind dancing, we close our eyes. And of course, now we even close our mouth, socially distance dancing. So with distance, we actually can practice dance. Most of the dance practices I do are more solitary, going inwards. But when we connect with others, we do it with a lot of respect. And these days, respect means six feet distance minimum. So again, it's about how we manifest in the world, how we set boundaries, how we respect each other, even without saying one word, to understand nonverbal communication, to understand social cues, things like that. Wow, yeah, I enjoy it. So <laughs> that is so good. That is so uh, great, Jankar. Thank you so much uh, for your sharing uh, every information for us everything good for us in this our life uh, i uh, i hope uh, you will be my friend forever and uh, i want to make a lot of friends like you and i can learn more things uh, from him uh, yes so same here same here yes <laughs> thank you so much uh, and uh, i will be a student with you and uh, i want to learn more things from you in this life inshallah and uh, shall we can uh, contact together, talk together, share uh, something together for the people around the world. And you promised to teach me Arabic and uh, the language of Sudan as well, right? When I come and meet you. <laughs> yeah, you are welcome. You, you are welcome. I want to teach Arabic and, uh, and uh, you can teach me uh, more language. And uh, you are perfect, mashallah. You have uh, more language in your mind. So uh, I have a, now I have a class of life. Uh, I want to I, I want to change that time, and uh, I want to some of people they they will enjoy with me to teach other language. Uh, uh, we can learn uh, Arabic, Urdu, uh, English, uh, some of language. Alhamdulillah, now I have a more than, uh, than more than one of uh, teachers. They are from around the world. They are native uh, Arabic. Uh, Urdu, English, French, Italians. My friends, they want to help me to grow the people. They talk each other of language. They learn each. Uh, uh, they learn some of language from other. Inshallah. That's wonderful. That's really, really wonderful. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay, Shankar. Uh, thank you so much again. Thank you for your time. It's my appreciate. You will be with friends and contact together and talk together. Shall we have a next session? Inshallah, talk more things. Uh, now we can't. Uh, we can't account now uh, everything uh, we want to say. But shall in the future uh, meet together and discuss some of section together. Inshallah. And thank you and Allah Hafiz. Namaste. Al Allah Hafiz, Namaste, Assalamu Alaikum. Assalamu Alaikum. <laughs>